Yes, thank you, uh, Stuart, and thank you all of you before me because it will be easier for me to. Uh, so I will be uh, starting the series of the presentations that are going more and more into the technical content and more and more into details. So still, although this one is still rather uh, generic and fundamental. Um, uh, this will be about performance-based approach. This is the aspiration of the model code that we try to uh, achieve, knowing that it's quite complex and probably we are not entirely successful. But uh, for reasons that I will uh, mention in the minute, uh, we decided to put it on one of the front pages saying that this is the future of uh, standardization. Uh, so um, I will tell you why, and I will also try to tell you what did we actually do and what still needs to be done. Um, uh, the first two uh, uh, paragraphs uh, here are actually the quotes from the previous speakers. Asi Akio and Stuart were talking about the need of having model code that is open for innovation. Uh, so one of the ambitions is to remove uh, constraints uh, that uh, uh, traditional uh, um, specification-based approaches impose for innovation. The second is uh, sustainability-driven approaches and life cycle approaches. This also means a very explicit consideration of certain targets. And uh, one of the objectives when we started to work on performance-based uh, approaches was to um, the question, how can we do it? And one of the things that is also not maybe yet clearly mentioned, but for us, it's so obvious that we nearly forget to say so, uh, Model Code 2020 attempted and successfully attempted to uh, coordinate provisions for new and for existing structures. And this is one of the things for which we also say performance-based approach is something that covers the whole life cycle. Let's see if we can also uh, take the challenge to be consistent in performance-based approach to design and in consideration of performance during um, assessment. Um, and uh, what is actually the, uh, the performance-driven uh, approach? Uh, this is an approach that um, seeks to um, um, argument, motivate, and prove that uh, performance requirements are met uh, during the entire life cycle. And uh, this performance requirements must be explicitly defined because otherwise we don't know what we are talking. And we engineers like to be very specific in, uh, in, in what we are doing. We only don't say when we talk about prescript, sorry, about performance-based approaches in which way to do it. We leave, we leave a lot of freedom for the, uh, for the designer. Or the benefits and, uh, and burdens uh, for the uh, prescriptive approaches, we know they are easy to apply. Uh, they give a quite um, straightforward answer to the questions, but they have a lot of limitations. Yes, they are actually bound to certain domains for which they have been developed, calibrated. Uh, there is an experience in doing so. So all these benefits, it's evident. But there are also a lot of disadvantages and particular disadvantages that they are not valid outside of their scope of validation. Sounds a bit of trivial, but this is actually a very big issue. Um, now, uh, when we talk about uh, performance-based approaches, what we aim to is uh, to um, expand uh, the scope, to uh, um, add flexibility, and um, uh, to allow uh, the owners, the stakeholders, to actually get what they want in an optimized way. So uh, exactly uh, fitting the demands. And this is also a great opportunity to op optimize uh, our design from different perspectives. So not over design, but deliver what has been asked. Well, there are obvious difficulties in doing so. One of this is what are the requirements, how to specify the requirements, how to deal with requirements that may be contradicting each other, and uh, how to perform these verifications of validations. And this will require additional skills. So actually this table, I will at the end of my presentation, we're talking about um, needs for future work, um, uh, repeat uh, part of that because we are not yet entirely successful in uh, removing all these um, constraints and burdens. Um, I hope you can 
take one more flowchart. Uh, we are we like flowcharts, and but this one um, attempts to um, uh, say something about how to uh, define and derive and specify performance requirements. Where do they actually come from? So let's start from the beginning. When I talk about performance requirements, I will be talking about performance requirements within the framework of sustainability. But Peter was talking about three pillars of sustainability. These are performance requirements derived for all three pillars of uh, sustainability, societal, including structural performance, environmental, and economic. Now, where do, where do we start when, we, uh, when the designers or stakeholders, or actually designers with stakeholders, start to analyze performance requirements? We usually start from the uh, high level strategic objectives. Quite often they are put in the um, uh, legislation, in policy objectives, they are generic. Um, not often uh, quantitative, but uh, quite uh, essential. Uh, we also have this high level objectives of the owners and stakeholders that are sometimes more specific, quite often very specific about the functions that and, uh, and um, uh, performance re requirements related to the functioning of the objects during the whole life cycle. And actually it's also the role of engineer to challenge them to uh, discuss the performance during the whole life cycle and also in the next life cycle, since we are uh, aiming at the circular solutions. Um, the composition of this performance requirements into more technical um, uh, performance specification, this is a process that is done or should be done with uh, multiple uh, triers. Not only the designers should be involved in that process, but also contractors producers and manufacturers of materials because each of them has their particular uh, needs and demands and uh, opportunities to uh, include these um, uh, performances in their stages and uh, contributions to the uh, constructing, designing, uh, maintaining the, the asset. So this is a process that should take part in a collaboration between different uh, parties. Uh, this is a challenge because we need to develop a common language. We need to start to understand each other. This is quite often what not yet has been uh, uh, done. Um, we are a bit uh, working in the segmented chain. We should try to make this chain uh, more connected. Um, uh, the, you see the multiple piles in different shades of, of uh, red. Well, this means that this is a circular process. We will not maybe make it in one run. Conceptual design may um, lead to um, observations that could revise performance requirements. So there could be a need for going back and uh, setting a new uh, requirements so that finally we can proceed into stages that are included in the life cycle from design to the, the commissioning of the structure and um, verifying whether during these uh, stages the performance requirements have been met. Well, important thing is also to uh, bear in mind that re performance requirements can change during the service life. They can change due to change of the exposure conditions, change to the uh, change of the function, uh, change of the demands, but also change to the policies. This is something that we observe now uh, when we shift our attention towards more uh, circular use of structures. This may also uh, lead to change of the requirements that we need to somehow consider. Um, uh, so, um, what kind of requirements are we talking about? Here I can refer to what uh, Petro was already showing. Um, we have decided to have a um, specific explicit set of uh, requirements that are related to structural performance, associated with the classic aspects of structural performance that we are all very well uh, acquainted with, but also uh, to uh, challenge uh, the designers to consider other aspects of performance societal performance with all this uh, here mentioned um, uh, facets of it, environmental performance at large and uh, economic performance requirements. In the end, it's not about optimizing for one set of subset of performance requirements. It's about designing for the balanced optimization of this multi-criteria uh, uh, design that we will arrive at when we start talking about performance. Now, performance 
cannot be designed, defined only by the uh, uh, designers. There must uh, um, be um, following from the demands that are um, um, de expressed by, uh, by different groups of stakeholders. And these uh, are examples how they could be defined. We could aim at, for instance, minimization of environmental burdens or minimization of the life cycle cost. Well, sometimes these two will be contradicting each other. So this is a challenge how to meet uh, these requirements uh, um, effectively during the design. Um, uh, and what is one more maybe short comment to make to where that there is an increasing refinement when we go through that process during the life cycle. Uh, uh, we start from the generic and we go into states more and more quantitative um, definition of this performance requirements. Well, evaluation, um, here again, I can refer to Peter, but I can also refer to the speakers who will come later because we will be showing multiple um, elements of the process of evaluation of performance requirements. Uh, important is to know that then they can be either quantitative or qualitative, and in both cases we will need to proceed in different manners. And uh, how do we proceed? Well, we can verify performance requirements uh, both by models. This is uh, a very uh, traditional way, but also uh, verification by testing or combination of verification by models of testing are very powerful to deal in particular with the innovations for which models may be not yet uh, established or not yet uh, sufficiently mature. And validation in particular in case where we have to deal with the uh, uh, life cycle performance maybe also in case of environmental emissions that we can validate on for the for the structures and um, uh, with regard to structural performance i can be very fast because uh, next speakers will go into uh, safety philosophy um, risk and reliability based approaches limit state approaches this is what has been um, consistently implemented in the model code for, for new and for existing structures so carol will tell you more in the minute um, non-structural performance evaluation as Peter mentioned we have chapters on that how to proceed with different um, um, uh, components of that part of evaluation most important is that evaluation must uh, in the end be a balanced evaluation on multiple pillars of sustainability this is what we what we underline there is also a particular chapter in the model code where you can find more um, um, uh, guidance on, on on that process well this is maybe not possible to read it now, but uh, when you will get the table of content, the presentation of Stuart, you will find that there are multiple chapters in which particular provision of particular parts of evaluation and uh, verifications, validations are, are provided. Uh, future outlook, one minute, yes, okay. Uh, uh, well, um, what we want to have in the future are standards that will enable innovation. It means that they will not disable what is good in the current standards. Therefore, uh, these prescriptive approaches are likely to remain in the standards. They are now also in the model code, uh, but because they are easy to use and they are effective and they can be implemented in the if they are implemented with uh, due at, uh, uh, attention to, uh, to applying them correctly. But what we want to have is this performance-based approaches that will uh, enable us uh, to deal with the innovations for which we do not want to wait for the prescriptive approaches because we have experienced that in the past how long it may take before for new materials this prescriptive um, uh, often uh, based on empirical experience uh, um, provisions are developed. Well, that means that we will have a lot to do, and it's very nice because when we finish one model code, we immediately start to think about what is next to come. Uh, so it looks like a challenge for the next generation. And uh, like we have been given challenge when the model code 2010 was finished to deal with existing structures and we hopefully succeeded. This is a challenge for, uh, for the uh, future. FIB um, uh, community activities. Um, we need to expand the methods to define performance requirements uh, and educate people. This is also one of the part. Um, and when I talk about that, it's uh, of course not only structural performance requirements, but all that uh, broad scope. We need to expand the methods for verification and validation because we do have already some, but not yet sufficient to cover, cover all types of innovation. And here, 
uh, a lot of attention probably will go into uh, the verification of long-term performance, which is even more complex because it involves also the effect of uh, time aging, uh, so durability. Fortunately, Carmen will tell you more about these aspects in the second part of the workshop. And here probably combination of testing and modeling could be a very effective uh, approach. Um, as I say, educate community and connect the chain. And uh, last but not least, um, we should not forget that there will be an effect of the procurement of uh, how the designers will proceed. So there is also probably a need to thinking what kind of uh, influences that's maybe outside of the scope of the work of FIB, but nevertheless, we are practitioners. We have to deal also with this kind of aspect. Different forms of contracts can motivate different uh, look at, um, at performances. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesca. Well done.